Good evening. It is with great enthusiasm that I introduce our next speaker, Dr. Max Snyder. He is the founding director of the Brain Center at UBC, which has 200 faculty members and has been awarded $60 million from the federal government, partially, to study the use and abuse of the brain. He has often spoken to the general public because he's a gifted communicator. I know we'll come away with important information on this topic. Max? Thank you, Marjorie Ann, for that, that generous introduction. Uh, it's great to be here uh, this evening, and what I really want to communicate with you today is that we're in the middle of a, of a revolution. We're in the middle of a revolution in our understanding of the brain, how it works, how it grows, how it functions, how it ages, and how it operates in health and in disease. And this revolution will have profound implications for our health system, for education, for parenting, for public policy at a variety of different levels, for how we deal with the downtown east side, for our legal system, our penal system. The revolution emerges, like many others do, from technological advancements. So modern brain research benefits tremendously from the revolution that's going on in imaging right now. The next slide just shows you that we are now capable of looking into the brain, seeing what parts of the brain are active when you're thinking of Mozart versus Shostakovich, when you're exercising self-control versus failing to exercise self-control. We can see not only what parts of the brain are active, but arguably, even more importantly, we're now developing the ability to see the circuits, to see the wires. The next slide gives you an idea of what the, wire, what the actual wires are connecting up the different parts of the cerebral cortex. Now, this is something we couldn't do before. 10 years ago, this picture would have been impossible. Now it's here. Now, these are anatomical wires you're looking at. But even more important, we're now able to look at the functional wires, at the short-term changes in connectivity that occur as we dance through our daily lives. There's a second feature that underlies this revolution, and that is the revolution in genomics. Next slide. In the year 2000, the first human genome was sequenced. It took $3 billion, represented an international consortium, took years. In 2009, a small company outside of San Francisco sequenced another full human genome. It took four people working four weeks and cost $50,000. That's a pretty dramatic rate of change. That was 2009, ancient history. In 2010, Another company in the United States sequenced a full human genome for $10,000. Took two people, one week. We're in a world in which, in the next few years, two years, five years, it's going to become feasible for all of us to know our genetic endowment in unprecedented detail. So what does this have to do with the brain? Well, the reality is that over 70% of the human genome is devoted to building, operating, growing, and running our brains. So most of genomics actually turns out to be neuroscience. Now, a gene is just a piece of DNA that is going to turn into a protein, or eventually going to make a protein, excuse me. So and the next slide starts to give you an idea of how we can use our new understanding of genomics combined with imaging to see how the brain actually operates. Here we're able to actually insert genes from a jellyfish 
the same gene that makes jellyfish turn green, into two neurons. And we can light them up, and all the surrounding uh, neurons are dark. If you look, you see the axon from one neuron, the sending end, connecting up at the terminal to the dendrite, the receiving end of another neuron. If you look at that little connection called the synapse, you look at it under high power, the next slide, next slide please, you get an idea of who the actors actually are at the synapse. At the top is the, is the transmitter being released by one neuron, and on the others at the bottom of this slide uh, are the receptors in the membrane of the next neuron, the receiving neuron. Why is it important that we understand this? Because it is in changing and regulating the strength of connections between neurons, it is by doing this that we learn. If you remember this lecture or any of the other talks you've heard this, this evening, it's because you change the strength of connections between neurons inside your brain. And you probably did this. You see that blue receptor on the left, the AMPAR, AMPA receptor? You, what you probably actually did was you stuck more of those receptors into your synapse and you basically trafficked them in there. And as a result, the same amount of transmitter, which rolled down from the top, was able to give you a stronger response. Understanding how to regulate the strength of synapses is going to lead to memory pills. It's going to lead to increases in our ability to learn. It's going to lead to increases in our ability to forget. Because in many cases, what we actually want to do is to forget things or turn down excitation that's too much. The next slide shows you that we are now at the point of being able to tickle or to silence individual brain areas. So understand that as we learn what particular functions different parts of the brain subserve and how to regulate the strength of connections to and from those brain areas, we're going to be able to turn down pathways, turn up pathways, exercise particular neural pathways, and we're going to get to the point in less time than we think where our powers are going to become arguably dangerous. So I'm not here to tell you what the solutions to these issues are, aside from locking up neuroscientists. I'm just here to alert you of the fact that the juggernaut is coming. We're learning more and more about how the brain works every week every year. I think one of the things I found interesting was to hear how many references to brain function there were in all of these other talks covering so many different areas. There's no question that what we're, that brain research is broadening its reach into society. Now the news is not all good. The next slide shows you Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Ronald Reagan died of Alzheimer's disease. Margaret Thatcher is still living in a uh, home in uh, England also, ravaged by the disease. I'm sure if I asked people in this audience, do you expect to live to 85? You'd all say yes. Well, if so, over 40% of you would have at least the beginning stages of Alzheimer's disease. So this kind of disease, Alzheimer's, Diseases like Parkinson's, stroke, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, other diseases of the aging brain are going to represent a huge societal challenge to us. What we're trying to do, and the center of our actions are here in Vancouver, is to build a facility in which we can harness the revolution in imaging, revolution in genomics, understanding the revolutions in understanding of how the brain works in a new facility, the next slide, called the Center for Brain Health. This facility is going up on the UBC campus. And the idea is to serve as a one-shop stop for all diseases of the brain. For the next 100 years, and that's what the architects tell me this building will be good for, this will be the place you go if you've got 
disease, you know, dis diseases that affect the brain, depression, schizophrenia, addiction, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, multiple sclerosis, autism, d dyslexia, fetal alcohol syndrome, I could go on and on. So the future is coming at us, and we hope that the Center for Brain Health is going to be there to help all of us as we deal with the diseases of the brain, and as we look to harness the power that is within our brains to improve our futures. Thank you very much.